data science has been becoming a growing profession and is also the heart of many organizations. That's why Data Science Portugal was born. The first community created by data scientists for data scientists. DSPT wants to gather anyone who works in the field and chat about any topic over this great subject. All members from our team are committed to make sure that the data science field evolves in a healthier and stronger way. To ensure that the focus is on sharing knowledge, we guarantee that our stage is not a place that supports any commercial or recruitment content, and our kind speakers are committed to share their experience for free. We want you. Let's do bigger things together. Join us at any event all around Portugal or online. Hello, we are going to start our first AIMA. This will be a, a little bit different event where we'll have free, uh, not speakers, but guests, and we'll be uh, able to ask them whatever you want, uh, assuming it is not a really deep and personal question. Together with me, we have Mafalda, which will be our co hostess. Say hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and I'll go briefly to present the three uh, guests. We have Leonid, a PhD researcher at the University of Antwerp. He was involved in several uh, communities. He was in TEDx University of Porto, the SPT, the SPT Day. We also have Miguel Monteiro. Uh, he is not a scientist, lead at Mojo Diagnostics, and he was involved in Data Science for Social Good and World of Data League. And finally, we'll have Ricardo Marx. Uh, he's a big data engineer at automotive aftermarket team at Bosch, and he was involved with the SPT and the SPT day. So I'll ask them to turn on their cameras and mics. Any second now? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. So Hello. how is this going to play out today? We have the slide where several people already posted questions. Right, and I'm going to go uh, follow up the sequence of questions that was most voted. The slide is still open, so you can vote in questions to change the order or uh, introduce a new question of your own. If anyone wants to ask a question personally, right, please tell us in the chat. Some of the team in the back office will put you in in the, in the platform, and we'll be able to ask them directly. Uh, at least you have to have a mic that other than that, uh, there is no issue. While you gather the courage to ask them a question directly, I will follow the questions that we have in Slido. So I'll share the screen quickly. Okay, so the first question is by Rui Mendes. When we talk about communities, uh, they are usually a non-profit uh, initiative. How can you motivate, motivate the staff over time and pass the culture to the new ones? Who wants, so, who wants to start? Okay, uh, rock, paper, scissor. <laughs> oh, I, can, I can go first, I can go first. Uh, that's okay. Uh, well, first, I'd like to uh, thank the organization of uh, Data Science Portugal for inviting me to uh, pretty much say whatever I want to say to whatever you guys want to ask. So that's 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 pretty cool. Uh, so thanks for the, the for the opportunity to be here with you today. Uh, with that question, <clears throat> yeah, uh, that's yeah, that's that's one of the toughest questions uh, when we're we're talking about nonprofit communities. Because uh, time is already one of the assets that's most uh, difficult to manage. And volunteer time, it's it's close to impossible to manage because people have their lives. Uh, our lives change every day. Uh, so it's it's quite hard to, to, to predict. Uh, in my case, what I found that works pretty well is to uh, motivate people with the mission. So this means 
being super clear on what we want to achieve as a tech com as, as a community what's our goal what's our focus what's our mission and values and uh, since the beginning really try to 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 instill that message on people so that we understand if people have a cultural fit with the community and see if it matches with what we want to achieve uh, and also to see if their expectations are met by what the community can also provide them. So for me, it's it's this uh, uh, mission and values fit between both people, uh, both sides. It works pretty fairly well. Um, and then on the other hand, it also works very well to lead people from onboarding to leadership. It's also something that I saw works pretty well. So when you get someone in the beginning, uh, be very transparent in terms of what we expect from them but also what they can achieve and where they can they can go inside the organization that gives you kind of a a, a light at the end of the tunnel the, the, of the tunnel something to aim at which is pretty cool okay. i don't know if any of my fellow colleagues has something uh, to say i i agree i, I agree with you i'm um, maybe perhaps one thing that i would like to add there's just going to be a bit of random tips there and here that, that I kind of picked up but I, I think that um, one one important one important aspect is so, also kind of to how is it walk the talk talk the walk always get confused about this expression uh, but but it's the, th the thing it's that yeah if if you're going to be the kind of person who's heading up a, a community but then doesn't don't, you don't get your hands dirty basically uh, it's going to be really hard to motivate others to, to do the same sometimes um then one other really cool thing and this is especially related to what miguel was saying about the mission and whatnot um it's that also constantly remind them of the mission but also the success that that you're having so for instance yeah i can i can for example um take take one case for from tedx when i, when I was organizing it so our first event was for 100 people, our second one were for, was for 600. And our goal was to try to reach uh, the most people we can in the university uh, and to share the ideas. And I think the, the cool thing was to actually see people discussing it afterwards. And every time I saw somebody discussing it, I would post it on our Slack saying, hey, see, uh, this, we started this thing, we did this thing. And that was really cool. And I think this also gave a lot of, a lot of um, motivation, so to say. Um, I don't know, Ricardo. Do you want to? Add? I would because I see this as a question. It's a two-part question. So one thing is about motivation. The other thing about culture. And I think we can talk about culture as a separate topic right after this. But uh, let's try maybe first stay on the topic of motivation. Uh, Ricardo, do you want to add anything? Yeah. The, in terms of uh, culture, um, it's always uh, important to uh, pass that to the newcomers. Uh, normally, the newcomers. Uh, I'm always strong and we know about that they always want to do some stuff and help a lot and over time we know that motivation is one of the problems <clears throat> we normally see um, that as a problem but uh, this time of rest uh, let me think that uh, changing people over time on the community uh, it's not actually a problem, it's good, because uh, one of the key points of the motivation is doing the same thing. So changing people over time, I think it's not a really bad thing, because they bring uh, new stuff uh, with their new motivations. And um, like this today, that we're trying the new um, approach. Um, and uh, I, I, um, I think that... Um, would be a good uh, uh, I don't know uh, community which tell us that uh, we are doing a great job because people uh, even though we are changing uh, through the the people that are managing the the community uh, we always have people to help us and want to help us and I think that's the key point that community wants all uh, together to join and uh, help the community in terms of motivation yeah uh, I, I know that's that's a, a key point on every nonprofit uh, community uh, we all know about that uh, and um, one of the skills that most of us 
especially uh, tech people uh, don't have it's dealing with people and motivate them and uh, that's um, actually a good thing to get in the community that's why uh, we also uh, tried this and uh, uh, it's a key point uh, to overcome which i don't actually have a great solution uh, i just think that changing uh, staff uh, over time will help the motivation of others yeah i think that also like still on the topic of motivation i think that there's there's a tip that i want to i want to give which may be a little bit counterintuitive in the beginning but uh, it really makes sense in the end, which is uh, to really establish uh, rules inside your organization. So this could be rules of governance, like uh, what's our structure, who, who do I talk to when I need this, but also rules in terms of what you should uh, give to the, to, to, the, to, the, to the organization. And that could be, for example, one thing that we did that we kept saying at Data Science for Social Good was uh, never give more than what we ask for uh, and never and never give and also never give less so it's kind of like okay there's this number if you want to give more you're free to give more if you want to to give less not so much so there's kind of this rule that people follow instinctively and then other people see everyone else following it and that motivates them towards okay this is a serious place this is a serious organization and i can trust the people around me um that also helps motivation quite a lot. Actually, actually, in general, I think I think this motivation is really connected. Like the motivation is really connected to how well you are structured or not. I mean, at least I'm talking from personal experiences that, yeah, if if I join an organization where their document they don't have the documents organized, the meetings are a mess. Probably after yeah two three weeks a month tops, I will I won't want to stay because I just cannot understand what can I do where can I, and when I'm talking about structure it's a lot of things it's what can I do when I join how do I onboard how do I understand how the organization works uh, what are all the processes um, I think I think all those things are very important to to have it clearly structured and yeah that's that's I think important uh, just to clear one part that's really important you can you can tell why. Uh, our uh, opinions that one of the uh, key points on the community is keep uh, all uh, people uh, motivated because in terms of culture uh, we uh, didn't need to talk uh, too much about that because i think most of the people get the, the culture of each community understand it but yeah uh, more more or less but it's easier to pass it uh, the motivation it's harder yeah but but i think those two things are connected uh, right yeah. so it's yeah, yeah. It, it it's the, the thing is that if you have a good culture and whatever your culture is it might be something stupid as i don't know um singing random songs and drinking beers at the end of every single gathering that you have or i don't know whatever whatever works for you or whatever floats your boat um but but those things kind of um unite people around something and that in it turns in turn brings um, motivation. So, and those those things, those things, those rituals slash culture, also important to to keep people together and the group together and the people feel because there is this I don't know whatever theory pyramid Maslow of needs or whatever. And then there's this part of belonging and that you you feel motivated when you feel that like you're belonging to a group. And if you can create something common amongst your group, then it's going to be harder for you to leave and you'll be really motivated into doing activities. I mean. Uh, I really enjoyed all of our DSPT barbecues and post uh, event dinners and so on because I think that was that was the thing that was motivating one of the things that this was motivating me for the rest. So, yeah. But but I think the difficult part is you cannot force someone to work or gave gave yeah. something. <laughs> or, you need to have motivation you need to work you need to do that you you don't do jogging or another thing i think this is the the hard working but i think this is what miguel said also that, that it's about the clear expectations from the beginning that okay we really need at least 
X amount of week, X amount of hours per week for me per week. I mean, of course, things happen and life gets in a way, but sometimes and you know there are weeks where it's really hard to give something. But uh, like at least have I don't know, say that okay, at least I need to one, two, three, four hours for you per per week. Obviously, some weeks might not work out because exams or because job deadline or whatever. But that that should be I think a really good rule of thumb because then it's also much easier to have an honest conversation with the person if he hasn't been active for already. I don't know, for one month, two months, three months, it's just to say, okay, we talked about this. You said you would have availability, but clearly you don't. What should we do next? And it's much easier to get the person as well to leave, so to say, nicely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> nicely. Uh, because there was a clear expectation, there was a clear set of rules, and the, con the contract, which is not really a contract, but the verbal contract was kind of broken there. So. So, yeah, that's why it's so important in the beginning when people get in, because that's usually the people when people get in they're they, they're usually clueless about the organization or they're they know and they're like highly motivated and they really want to do stuff. So that's kind of the for me, that's one of the most important points for you to grab this person and tell them, OK, here you have a bunch of stuff to do. We meet every I don't know, every Monday and uh, come in, talk to us and let's see how this goes. Um, in terms of that, those first weeks that the person that the person joins, you 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 cannot let them disappear. You have to really go yeah. after them. Yeah. At the SSG, we we started with a, a buddy. We had like a buddy scheme. Uh, so we we have uh, different departments, mm -hmm. and the owner of each department is responsible for this person to onboard them. But then each new member also has a buddy, and this buddy is just responsible to follow up with everything and answer every single question and be available. Um, in our case, we can do this because we don't onboard a lot of people uh, on our mm -hmm. lead team. We don't have a lot of rotation of people. So this is something that scales very well in our case. But but you can also do it in a bigger organization because, for instance, this is also what happens in, in the, the, the board, of, at, at, best, at least at Best Porto, where I was part long time ago in my student years. Um, this is exactly the same thing that happens. That first, you have this big recruitment process where you just do basically natural mm -hmm. selection. And when I, what I mean by natural selection is that there's just these three, four, or five steps that you need to take in order to become a member, and then just people drop out in the middle and say, "Okay, this is too much work." Uh, and basically, by the end, uh, when you would become a member, then you would get also something. Yeah, it's not a mentor or a buddy, but it's more it was an angel. Um, that the idea would be it's just be one person who could, yeah. Talk to that person and say, okay, what's your motivation? What do you want to do to a bit motivate them to apply for certain calls, some internal calls, um, to to add answer any questions they might have, and so that they're not lost. So kind of babysitting them in the first couple of months of their membership, and then as time goes by, of course, the link is less and less. Okay, thank you. Next but question. Actually, <laughs> Maybe just I wanted to add one more thing, but that's really quick because I just remembered something that, that Ricardo was saying that, uh, yeah, our, we're technical people in our skills. We don't know much about motivation, but it's actually not that hard to learn about motivation. The only thing that you need to do is just think for yourself, why do you do what you do? And I mean, why do you spend your free time now sitting, talking to me and not, I don't know, having beer somewhere, right? And why do you spend your free time and preparing all this stuff? It's like, why do you do it? And ask this to yourself, but also to the other members of the organization. And there you can get already a lot of insight of how to motivate someone. Sorry for that. Okay. Thank you. Mario, I just, you... Want, I just want to make two points really, really quickly before the next question. <clears throat> I understand your points that you have to have a, set, a strong set of rules, but that works when you have a big community that is already structured when you start a new one from scratch that will push out all your volunteers quickly maybe i don't know and, and no 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 i don't i don't, I don't agree i, I have my sorry, second sorry point to, yeah, yeah sorry to interrupt go ahead I, I don't want all of you to agree with each other please <laughs> yeah I, I think i i please disagree with each other. there a little bit because <laughs> I, I no i definitely disagree with that uh, because I mean, every community starts as a small community. I mean, in our case, uh, at DSSG, our lead team is uh, less than 20 people. Can I just start? So it, when you're it's talking really about community, are you talking about uh, people who organize this stuff, or is it the whole community? Or 
that's yeah. Different. I mean, that's that's yeah. That's that's another that's another conversation. When I when I mean motivation, I'm more worried about organization because you 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 have to manage your volunteers. At least that's how I interpreted the question initially. Uh, because if we're talking about the overall like the target audience, then we're gonna start talking about communication. How better to communicate with your external people? I was talking more about organizers. I think we all kind of revolved around that idea. No, no, I, know, I know that, I know that. I'm just talking for this, I'm talking about this specific question because one thing is it's that you say you have a small, you're just starting, you have a small organization, but then you could be starting, you still have a small organization, but the community could be already big. So that's why I'm trying, just for this case in particular, I'm making this difference. Uh, you uh, move on because there is no right answers and you'll not be graded. <laughs> I, I, I like the body uh, approach, Miguel. For me, I think yes. that's a good, good up. Again, I, I want you to disagree, not agree with each other, please. <laughs> <laughs> it is not fine. Okay. Next question. What do you think uh, of communities where values and goals are not transparent? I can go with the first one. Uh, ask them. If you have doubts, ask them. I, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, how to tell you, uh, but if you feel that something wrong uh, on that part, why as a community or a member of the community, don't ask them or uh, uh, suggest an improvement uh, on, on that side, because you feel like that's sketchy. I don't know, just tell them. I, I don't, I actually, on this part, I don't want to enter on the, uh, they are there for something else. Or I, I don't want to go to that side. I just think when you feel that uh, something, uh, you have doubts on that community, and but you are interested on, on getting in, uh, more in the community, but you feel something is wrong, ask them. Why not? If they don't answer, that's that's my two points yeah i think it, it can be it can be this can happen due to different two different reasons one of them is what ricardo was saying which is i mean we're not really sure about why this community exists you don't really organization exists you don't really know what they're trying to achieve it sounds kind of shady okay that's one, one scenario and then there's the other case that i also that I've also seen before, which is communities that don't really that don't really know, that have never even thought about their mission and what they're trying to achieve. They started very organically as just a group of friends organizing a couple of things. And then it kind of kept growing, more people kept coming, and then they never had the time to stop and think about, okay, what, what are we trying to achieve? What, what's our roadmap in the next one year, two years, three years? So that could also be the case. So maybe that's a that's a conversation. A conversation started. If you if you bring up that topic, maybe you will you will have other people thinking about it and define those goals on paper. That never happened to anyone to start talking about what we did. Um, what I'm what I'm thinking it's that. Um, I mean, it's it's. A, I feel like the question is a bit too generic. I don't know if it's targeted at some example or not. Um, but yeah, I just I just think that it's I don't know. It's it sometimes feels that it could be a bit selfish on one hand that if you're I mean if this is the point of the question as well that if you're trying to use a community for your own business whatever reasons. But on the other hand, if it's a win-win situation where yeah you get business for yourself but you're also serving a greater good. I don't know. A bit divided. I think that the question should be a bit more specific. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Just as long as that's stated in the goals and mission, I have nothing against communities that are driven by business. You know, I, I'm all I'm all for that. But it's just it needs to be transparent, right? Yeah, I I, I just want to grab what Miguel said, and uh, I think it's the key point uh, on this matter. Sometimes it's friends uh, starting something and and uh, in the beginning they don't know about everything and they probably can't see uh, the the points that probably you are seeing as wrong or a different uh, opinion or think that's that's uh, not really transparent part but sometimes that happened because uh, uh, 
starting communities sometimes is, is really fast or needs to be fast and it could be a mistake there. Uh, assume that sometimes could be a mistake and if it's a good community, people normally are open to hear or, or uh, answer something uh, uh, that you need to, to be clear. Otherwise, I don't know. Uh, if if they continue with that, it's your option because normally, as we have seen, that there's a lot of uh, communities that uh, f have most of the same topics on on some matters. Not all, but you can uh, go to another that uh, interests you in the same in the same point. Okay, thank you for your answers. We'll move along to the next one. What can be done to bring together communities during a lockdown? Imagining that this is communities as a whole and not the organizing team, It's right? communities. It's not organization. Yeah. It's written yeah. communities, right? Yeah, different problems, right? Well, I think I think that already what you're doing, it's, for example, in the case of DSPT, it's also already quite, quite nice. And, um, and if, yeah, whenever I start talking, my dog starts replying to me. I'm sorry. Uh, so I think that already what you're doing, okay, I'll leave, give the lead to someone else and I'll be right. He's disagreeing with you. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Ricardo? Uh, for me, it's kind of hard because uh, I've been uh, uh, away for a while, especially on this COVID time. So in terms of, of experience on uh, uh, bringing the community uh, to this uh, type of uh, solutions, it's, it's kind of hard because we, we worked a lot with uh, networking. Uh, Leon already told that the dinners and the things that we had when we could talk with each other and discuss some stuff uh, that that uh, bonds the, the community and bring them again because they like to have um, live conversations. Uh, I understand that's the key point here to solve. Uh, I actually don't have any solution uh, for this. Uh, I think this type of approach that you're trying uh, uh, can bring more uh, uh, communities uh, or community people for to uh, get um, um, more connected. But um, obviously, um, it's temporary. Uh, I, I don't know if we should uh, think about uh, too much about that because someday we're going to grab a beer on our meetups and discuss again about this, hopefully. I actually don't have a, a great solution for this because this is always a little bit disconnected. I think you need more of a mindset of an engineer. You, don't no, have, you don't have any solution for free questions now. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 it's building a bit on what I was saying before. Um, it's but the thing is that it's never going to be the same thing as going out and having a beer and discussing whatever you thing you want to discuss live. Obviously, no, and and we shouldn't compare that the online is going to the same thing as being live in person with people. Uh, but the other point I want to make is that still you can take use of technology to still kind of bring some bring people together. Um, depends on the size of, of your community, obviously, and the goals or what you want to achieve and what you want to do. So you can start with having these kind of roundtables. You can have some kind of online networking sessions. You can organize some board games or a quiz night with your community. Who knows? Um, you can, for example, because there's a lot of a lot of these things that are already there online. Um, you can engage them through through actual Slack or whatnot. Of course, it's always hard to how do you then how do you make those things a bit more dynamic and how do you moderate those. But I think that there's a variety of tools that you can use. But I think it's never going to be the same, obviously, as um, being live in person. Yeah, Miguel, go. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on what Leon said because uh, I I think that that's the first mistake, which is to try to replace what you had. So in, in my opinion, and I mean, what, what I've done before is 
first you sit down and you recognize that the problem exists and you don't try to replace it. So you see what got broken because of lockdown and because of COVID. And you try to also find out new doors that open because uh, depending, obviously, depending on your organization, there could be uh, other opportunities that you've never tried before. Maybe you didn't even consider it because it was out of focus, out of scope. Uh, we have so many other things to do. We don't have time to th for this. And maybe if you have your operations kind of stopped a little bit, it gives you time to try other things. It gives you time to try things that you've never tried. I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, in DSSG, what we do is social, data science social good projects. So we need data and uh, we, we need problems. And this comes from real world uh, organizations and nonprofits in Portugal. What happened with COVID? Most nonprofits closed uh, or uh, put their, their employees uh, in part time work and their operations stopped. So most of our projects and the projects that we had agreed with them also mm -hmm. stopped. So in the beginning of 2020, we had a, an estimated year of growth in terms of number of projects and it tanked completely because all of our projects got canceled or postponed. Mm -hmm. So what did we do? We, we sit down and we talked about it. We, we, we initially we were thinking, okay, let's try to find a beneficiary somewhere else. So there you go. First error, trying to replace. And then we started thinking, okay, let's, let's think a little bit outside of the box. Let's look at the, the at our bucket list. And the one thing that we never tried was to work with government data and open data. And this solved our problem. Why? Because for this, we don't need beneficiaries. The data is all there. The problems are all there. So the, the, the problem that was created by the lockdown, which is lack of resource A, wasn't needed anymore with this new problem or with this new challenge that we were trying to pursue. So we, we went full speed ahead with the open data projects. And it actually uh, turned out to be even better than what we assumed. And now it's something that we're doing um, as part of our scope as an organization. But in general, not tr don't try to replace what you have. Uh, use the time that you have left to try something else and risk because you have nothing to lose. OK, thank you for your answers. Maybe I can also add, maybe just piggyback on what uh, Miguel said. Don't see this as an as a, as a lose something that you're losing, but actually it's an opportunity to try new things out. That in the future you might actually keep them. So, yeah. yeah, you you can actually uh, expand your community because imagine that you're focusing only on Portugal. Uh, uh, at this time, you can grab a lot more and expand your community. You have that option. Uh, it's uh, it's I've been done for communities Kubernetes and uh, others. They they have uh, a lot of uh, not this way, but they have people talking about their problems and how, how to discuss uh, or address the, the the community problems. And um, they are always online on this part, and uh, it has been done. So I I think uh, it's a uh, if uh, we um, end this mess of COVID, um, um, for in my opinion, uh, obviously, uh, I think uh, people uh, shouldn't forget this type of um, approaches online. So keeping um, the community, uh, the network community, uh, in place but i think with this type of approaches you can expand your community and bring more um, as a whole okay thank you um two 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 quick qu uh, comments i want to tell fabio cardoso that he's writing in youtube that he can ask in slack uh, sorry in slido or directly in proficonf uh, someone in the in the team will uh, pass them this message, and we have our first volunteer to make a question live here. So, David, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, uh, it's great to see you all and uh, uh, to to have you here to to explain uh, to give your insight. Uh, I would like to know. I I want to make a community uh, on my job place and um, I want to make a sort of a report 
uh, to to my superior on that. Um, what sort of uh, metrics do you collect to, to measure the impact? And what are usually the most sexy metrics to present and to, to give them uh, a good uh, overview of our work? Thank you. Thank you, David. So our guests. <laughs> Okay, this is a tough one. I'll, I'll, I'll go first. I'll be the guinea pig for this one. Um, I think, I, I mean, there's, a, let's say, in, in, in your case, David, I would say there's two types of metrics you can, you, can, you can identify. You have metrics that are related to the objective of your, of your organization. So if you're trying to do an organization that saves abandoned puppies, then maybe a metric would be the number of puppies you saved. So on this one, I cannot suggest anything because you didn't clarify, so I really don't know. Uh, but then there are other more like general metrics um, that are that are kind of horizontal across different organizations. But even these metrics, it depends on your objectives. For example, one metric that I like to consider is retention rate, retention rate of volunteers. Uh, but it could be the case where you have an organization where you actually want to rotate people a lot because you want to give opportunities to many people. So a high retention rate could be good or bad, depending on your objectives. But yeah, retention rate is something that I look at usually. Yeah, I will piggyback on this and generalize it a bit more, I think. So in general, when you're thinking about these metrics for the communities, mm -hmm. I really cannot give you a... Well, I can give you some examples maybe in a bit, but I would I would um, I would always think about the internal and external ones. So you always have the external KPIs, which usually are related to your mission vision, just like Miguel said. So if it's um, I don't know if it's the number if it's the number of puppies you, you if you want to save puppies, the number of puppies saved. If in the case, for example, uh, for best where you really want to kind of put uh, technological students in multicultural environments, It's then you would just calculate the number of students that participate in those multicultural events, for example. Um, so those are really like external specific, but then you have the internal ones. So the external ones, they just measure your impact and just they're kind of the ones that you want to also show outside as well to say, okay, we really have impact. So, um, so as to show to whatever your donor sponsors, blah, blah, blah. But then you have the internal ones, it's just to understand how healthy your organization is, right? So is it that uh, how many, just like Miguel said, how many volunteers do we have? And then again, this really depends on your culture uh, and what is a good metric or not. Uh, it's how many, uh, it could be, for example, how many hours of meetings if you want, if you're trying to minimize or maximize for some reason your hours of meetings. Really depends on your internal structure, really depends on what, what you want to do. But those that I'd say are a bit more like health concern wise than anything else. For instance, you could be a uh, small volunteer organization, which is just five people. And then those don't even make sense at all. But for example, the retention rates, because it's always those five people. Uh, so yeah, think, think of, I think that's a good direction to think about. Well, I think it's almost, uh... Everything uh, is said. You're gonna say you uh, don't know, right? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I think I understood that uh, you wanted to create a community at your work. Um, uh, so, if, if that's so, um, the metrics to show to your, uh, I don't know, superiors or fancy uh, KPIs um, will not be uh, possible uh, you can let's say sell what uh, that community can bring to your um, uh, your work so uh, if you want the um, the improvement of uh, knowledge of of the people that with you you're working and with that community you can uh, can have that uh, shown, um, but the amount of people that you have there um, will be, uh, I don't know, probably most of the people will go there, but that's the number that you can't trust. Uh, 
uh, or measure uh, uh, too much uh, or trust too much too much on that one. And um, actually, um, if um, a community inside uh, uh, of work normally have lots of different topics to approach, it's kind of hard to have a metric because some topics will interest more on some people and others uh, will interest uh, have more interest on, on a smaller amount of people which is hard for you to uh, have a fancy uh, KPI um, and trustable to, to show. The only thing that you can uh, bring if it's, if I understood correctly, for your uh, company community uh, will be um, what you will improve uh, for them. And this is tough, but this is what uh, they will ask you. Uh, and actually that number will not exist. You can say some words, beautiful words about that. But <laughs> but uh, what you can say is you, you can bring uh, speakers that can improve or share more knowledge. And with that, all the company can grow with that those numbers will come on the end, not on the beginning, on the starting point. At least it's my uh, perspective. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but I think that it's still important from the beginning to think about what are the KPIs you want to measure because it might happen that then you don't measure them, right? If you don't know what to measure. But you're talking about thresholds, uh, so uh, what you want to achieve, correct? Usually, because usually the goals is not the same thing. So it's not the same thing as the KPI, right? So yeah, first, yeah. First think about the goal and then how do you measure that? So I think it's still important. I mean, if this is something you it, that's important for you to have some metrics, then it's important to think about it right from the beginning. Uh, sorry to, to interrupt the discussion, but we have a lot more questions that are popping out and we are still on the fifth one so uh, i will ask you all to <clears throat> don't do an essay simply answer as truthful as you can um sharing again the slide oops does it matter So Anonymous asked, who let the dogs out? I don't know. Um, I don't know, but I think David's organization is trying to save a few puppies. So that might be good. <laughs> Leonid had a dog there. Uh, Cookie, with the dog. Him. I don't know, but she's hiding here somewhere. <laughs> Not the first time she's appearing on a live streaming. I think she's the most famous dog in the data science live streaming world. <laughs> So cute. Yeah. So, so we'll go to the to, to, to better question. Okay. What advice can you give to anyone who wants to start a community? I can, I can start. I can start on this one. Okay, that's also uh, don't. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, don't create a community just because. Uh, uh, f uh, just uh, see if there's already some communities because there, there, there are a lot of communities. Um, so just check if there's one community that's already have uh, uh, what you need and help them. Uh, ask them if they need help and, and just um, go uh, that way. Starting a community, um, I, I think um, one key point uh, is uh, to be different. Uh, if you feel that you need to, that, that uh, there's no community that uh, can give you uh, thing that you uh, that you need, you, you you feel free to to create your own 
what uh, you you will get the problems that we discussed in the in the beginning so uh, the culture and the motivation of of your team uh, will always be a problem so uh, be aware of what we said in the beginning uh, and uh, after that I, I think you're okay uh, on starting the, the community it, it always um, a good option to hear uh, a lot of opinions when you start um, and check what uh, drive uh, drove people to 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 see what what's happening in your community when you're starting start uh, small and uh, grow uh, over time don't try to impact in the first or, or second because you'll be unmotivated uh it, it's it's normally a uh, um, a growing uh, let's say uh, job it's not a job but it, it's it's a it's a work in progress all the time so um be aware of that um, maybe i'll piggy right a bit on what you said um yeah I, th I, th I think the most important thing is that before you start of doing one it's just Put a bit of structure and think about why do you want to start a community many communities sometimes don't have a why because they just start organically because it's then random people who meet together to play chess or to discuss whatever topic and then suddenly it grows um but if you're so and then I'm, I'm not talking about those cases i'm talking about the case where if you really want to be proactive and you want to start something because you see that there's a need um and this is already a bit of a spoil for for a next question that's coming up of why DSPT started, but it started basically because uh, Hui Minch, who was one of the founders, needed to discuss um, data science related topics since he was the only data guy at his company with someone. And then that kind of one thing led to another, right? Um, but there was clearly a need and there was clearly a goal of why, why it was done. And then, um, and then another thing is that I would start with something um, small, Exactly, just as uh, Ricardo said. I mean, try to first uh, gather key people, people who are interested, um, test your content. Content is very important. So it's like, why do you bring everyone together? Is it to talk about what? So are you going to have some talks? Are you going to have some networking sessions? Are you, what are you going to do with that, with that company and I think that serve that community? And I think the content is very much key um, when you're when you're starting in any community and um, talk a lot to people. So those people who you're inviting is, is are the things that we're doing interesting, are things that we're organizing interesting and getting all this feedback and improvement and so on. It's much easier when it's a small community and it's small events or small not online, whatever. If it's 15, 20 people, it's much easier to talk to them per, per to person rather than talking to everyone. And I really think that in these things, uh, word of mouth is works quite well in terms of promotion and so on. So this is also why I think uh, kind of organic growth is good. And I'll leave it here. So okay, Miguel can have something to add as well. Yeah, I, I agree completely. So I will, I will start talking about something else uh, that I give another hint, uh, I would say. I think that it's very important when you start your, your community, obviously define yourself and everything that Ricardo and Leon were talking about. But but if you think about the second thing that you should start thinking about, for me, it's uh, to, th to think about uh, the sustainability of the community. So this means not only financial sustainability. So what's the business model with that community if, if there needs to be one? I mean, if it's just a chess club, maybe you don't need to. But maybe if you're going to start uh, competing in the, the European chess tournament, then you're going to need money to pay for trips, pay for food, pay for, I don't know, chess workshops. So uh, the, your need for money is going to show up very, very fast. And it's a good idea to be prepared before uh, you actually need the money to spend. I mean, obviously, we've all been founders uh, at some point of communities, and we know that in the beginning, it kind of comes out of our own pocket. Uh, so we, we bootstrap the communities a little bit, but it's very important to build your business model uh, uh, along the way. So this is financial sustainability. And then also sustainability in terms of the organization. What happens to the organization if when you disappear, when, when it's not your time anymore? How do you pass on the torch to someone else? Or is the organization going to finish because you decided to leave? 
Uh, I mean, there's that famous quote that we know, with great power comes great responsibility. And when you're a founder of, one, of an organization, you need to think about what's going to happen after you leave. That's very important before you actually do so. Yeah. So just to share something that's different. I think that's important, but I think I wouldn't worry too much about this in the very, very first, first steps, the baby steps, I would say. I, I would definitely keep this in mind and I would definitely not discard it too well because it will hit you fast that you need sponsors for doing X and it will hit you fast that, yay, I don't have time for this anymore after three years and now there's no one to take over. I, I agree with that, but um, I think that those are things that... I would think already when you have an idea of how well your community is doing. So first try to have some dry runs or something like that, that you want to call it of your events or what you want to do. And then you can start to have an understanding of how you can make it a bit more sustainable. But that's my opinion, of course. Yeah, I think the only thing that uh, it's really important is um, you're, you're thinking that uh, you, you're going to start small. Uh, the SPT started uh, in a building in a very university with some laptops some of them failed i think Rui Mendes uh, blow up one of the laptops um <laughs> yours mario <laughs> okay <laughs> so um lots of technical problems lots of stuff to improve but we started small i don't know how many people were 16 uh, 20 at most but the SPT started that way uh, uh, with an idea of share and discuss some problems that everyone is having. So let's uh, get all together and start a community to, to talk about this. Because uh, I know some people are having this same problem, so we can help each other. Okay, but it's our small. Uh, obviously, we, we had more events and more events and people uh, got us to know as leon uh, told um people got uh, start to talk about us and uh, uh, went for our meetups to know what we were doing and that worked really well because people liked uh, to be there and f uh, felt uh, um I don't know uh, a, a good community to discuss their their problems also and and um uh, and um, they liked the, the obviously the content. The, the speakers are important. Uh, what Miguel told that's also important in your future uh, sponsor. Uh, if you think you're not have, you will not have a community with sponsors. Yes, you can have. It depends what you want to do, uh, but that that will be discussed in the future, for sure. I just let's move on to yeah. I just want to real well, yeah. Sorry, sorry, man. Just real quick. I, I remember that there's one tool that might be useful if anyone is thinking of starting a community or thinking about one, which is the community canvas, which is kind of the business can business model canvas, but for communities. Um, it has some topics. I mean, I don't think my personal opinion is that I don't think you need to think about every single topic that's on there to start a community, but at least it gives you some baseline of what you could think about when starting it and kind of helps you out there. I left it in the chat and uh, profit call, I don't know, can be shared somewhere else later. So Thank uh, you. let's go to the next question. So we, we have more questions now that when we started. Uh, no, it's, it's a good metric. People are engaged, uh, but we are replying too slowly. Uh, probably this will be the time that the event should end initially. And if there is no issue with anyone in the call, we'll try to go at least at eight, maybe. There are people in different time zones, so let's try that. So the next question is... Um. What would what would you do differently if you had the chance to go back and start over? Hmm? Talk about my experience from TEDx, uh, and I think a lot of people will always see themselves there. It's that um, 
I, th I think that there, and this is related to what Miguel talked about in the previous question. It's about the sustainability and um, yeah, financially we were good, but the sustainability of how do you get the next organizer when you want to leave, for example. Uh, and, and clearly and clearly, there, there was an issue there. It's that nobody really wanted to take the lead. Um, I can pinpoint to several reasons. It could be because, yeah, or I was doing too much versus uh, like taking on a lot of roles which should have maybe been delegated a bit more. Um, it's because probably I did not think or prep someone who could um, who could come and take over this. So this is something that you can do strategically already. So if you're starting a leadership position in a community and you know in two years you won't be able to stay there, you can already start thinking, okay, I need to prepare at least one, two or three people. And so even if you don't tell it directly to them, but you need to prepare them so they can take over in two years and learn enough and be motivated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, th I think that would be one of the main probably things I could do differently. I would do differently. Anyone wants to share more? <laughs> or disagree? I can't can disagree. disagree. <laughs> I can't. Uh, <laughs> no? Actually, actually, uh, what Leon said, uh, I agree a lot. Because uh, as I told before in the in the beginning, um, I I think that uh, let's call the leader uh, of a community uh, for me in my, my opinion shouldn't be there forever uh, things should be uh, should change uh, over time so people can bring new ideas and uh, the community uh, evolves that way and uh, that's a key point um, how to um, be able to delegate uh, tasks and uh, normally one of the problem is, is the responsibility of others. So if they don't do the job, you're going to compensate because it, it needs to be done. And um, that way, normally uh, there's a problem because people don't feel responsible because someone else is going to be, don't feel, don't feel accountable for that. So they, they have no uh, trouble on um, leaving uh, behind some some tests because life um, and uh, that's the key problem when you want to um, move on uh, and um, uh, have someone to uh, help the community uh, in a responsible way and know how to and and that's actually a, a real problem the, um, one of the one of the good approaches would be um, at least um, horizontal management, let's say. I, I don't know how, how, how to say this, but several people have this um, a set of skills that could be the same, but all of them can compensate each other and know about or have the know, know how to, and ha can uh, have the decision about something. Uh, these solve two things. Uh, if one leaves, others can compensate that and no one needs a blocker because sometimes uh, it, talking about nonprofit uh, communities, uh, we have our lives. We do this after hours. We do after our work and some days are bad at work. Uh, we just want to get home, have a drink and say, I'm I'm I want to rest, and we have to do that because uh, no one ha uh, can uh, help you. Uh, it's your responsibility, and and this way, uh, um, uh, you can have someone or request someone please uh, compensate me on this one. I know you can do this, and um, you're not a blocker uh, for the team. Sometimes, uh, if you have a really strict uh, um organization that could happen and uh, being strict uh, very uh, uh, well defined sometimes it's it's bad because people uh, um, get on that point that is that's not my responsibility um, and it, when that happens you lose the let's say um, community uh, 
motivation because we are here to help each other and sometimes that don't, don't happen uh, but uh, yeah that's that, that's what i think i think uh, leon uh, uh, said it's really important because sometimes you you um, feel that no one is there uh, to replace and uh, that's not a good thing I'm going to keep my answer, my answer super short, uh, and it's super specific, but I, I regret not uh, investing more on design and communication early on. I think that's something really important that we tend to forget when we're starting a community, but having a good design, uh, figuring out how you want to communicate to your public, that's something that I regret not thinking about uh, earlier on, because uh, if everything talks. So design is getting more and more important. It's something that I learned, definitely. But you're about to say, I regret not to invest early on in crypto. <laughs> in Dogecoin. <laughs> I'm going to leave that for uh, backstage talk. OK, next question. Mario, share the slide, please. So it was. So, my father, you're really good now. Okay. Uh, what are the main perks of being part of a large community? Do you have a personal story? <laughs> Who wants to start? Leon? Who has, who has a new house, car? Who of you have moved outside of Portugal? <laughs> I think. <laughs> Can we see your tax uh, documentation? <laughs> What is your income right now? <laughs> Leon is <laughs> dropped. Who is the chef? <laughs> oh, he's very. Um, well, I, I can tell that. Um, um, Who pay for the gamer stuff? <laughs> Me. That's sorry. Um, but yeah, what what can you? have on this one uh, well uh, at least for me um it it is the um, the network uh, that was created uh, along the way um the people that i know that i know i can contact about some uh, technical stuff that i need or uh, don't understand the um, we we can have uh, a beer with each other and talk about other stuff. I, I think that that's the main reason um, uh, I was on the community uh, was because uh, I wanted to discuss about some my problems and solve them because sometimes I didn't have no one to to discuss with that uh, with it uh, and um, obviously drinking a beer, which really important uh, for the SPT. Uh, but that's the main. Uh, key point obviously with the this uh, i i got some knowledge i can't say knowledge but i i i touched the the, the part uh, of leading uh, teams uh, would bring some some knowledge on that how to deal with people different types of people different types of uh, zones um, uh, way of thinking and uh, that um, got me um, um, uh, a better experience and how to approach some problems uh, in my life and how to uh, uh, discuss them. Um, that's one of the, the key points on, on this part. My car, I paid for it. <laughs> through the job you got because, uh, no, I'm joking. Um, uh, yeah, I think I, I think it's going to be more or less around all those things. It's, it's think of, well, a couple of things actually. Well, first is a network that you create. Um, I think that's, that's irreplaceable. I mean, yeah, as we already said in the beginning, I mean, me and Miguel and also Hui, who's one of the co-founders of the SPT, we co-founded uh, World Data League. And a lot of things that are happening there and that some partners that we had, it's definitely because of the network that we already had from before. So I think that that's 
that, that can be very important. Um, then it's exactly what, what Ricardo said. It's, you get to learn a lot of things that you don't learn, uh, let's say, in a technical field. I mean, I'm not going to details about blah, 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 leadership, blah, 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 motivation, blah, 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 all those things. Um, but but I think, I mean, I'm going to sound really lame now, but I think it's also the friends that you get. So I got a lot of connection while being there of people I did not know before. And again, I'm just going to give a couple of examples that again, it's Miguel and I mean, there they became practically very close friends and so much that we co-founded the, the um, another project together. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of perks to say. Yeah, it's your turn. I won't add anything else. I don't want to, to change the mood uh, from what yeah. Leon said. <laughs> very emotional right now. But it's very, very true. I mean, I, I can do more on this one. It's probably the point where I agree the most with, with both Ricardo and Leon. So moving on, when, when you still agree with each other. <laughs> this was the question in YouTube. Uh, I don't think the... the the person is still watching us, but we, I want to make it. Uh, I want to make it in the in the stream. How can you see in a post-vax world the IT teams management? Are the workmates becoming more flexible or conservative to fight changes? You all work in a company, right? Uh, I'm I'm not really sure how to pick up this question because I, I, I I'm not sure if I understood it correctly. Uh, I, think, I, think I, think about, I think I think it's about, but maybe I'm wrong. I think it's about it's that how this a team team management is going to change, or better, how this uh, whole COVID thing is going to change the IT team management after we get to go back to normal life. I think that's the question. That's how I read it, at least. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it's. Uh, Correct interpretation of the question. Yeah, uh, I'm in terms of IT management. I, I, I'm maybe I'm the odd one out, but I don't see that this will change that much in in the IT world, uh, other than the remote work and how remote yeah. work will will influence everything. Of course, I mean IT management will have to adapt to remote work. That's for sure. But IT is probably the areas where I see the 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 least change, other than remote work. With uh, with what happened with uh, with the pandemic, uh, because the the IT world was already a world that's super fast pacing compared to any other industry, uh, it it evolves very fast. Uh, so I think that fast being fast and changing fast is something that's already the mindset of uh, of someone who works here in this in this field. Uh, and my second point would be the reasons where IT. The point where IT moves slow, for example, legacy is probably one of the reasons why IT companies move slow and, and, and just drag back that big anchor. I don't think that COVID made such a, a big dent on this mindset, which is still a problem on, on, on IT. Yeah, I, th I think I agree. But I, th I think I agree, yes. But I think also and um, that there were still a lot of even IT companies who were reluctant in this remote work. So I think you will see more of that. The, the other day, I was just uh, randomly browsing um, a job, whatever, offer sites. And you can see already right now way more offers that offer rem the remote possibility. And this will, I think this will, I mean, especially for the man IT managers that are not used to uh, managing remote teams. Uh, and, and then you suddenly want to hire besides people from your own country, from different countries. I think this is something that's going to bring an additional, let's say, difficulty, at least for the managers. And there might be some pain there. But otherwise, yeah, IT will be more or less working in the same way. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, de it depends on the companies. I uh, know some companies that uh, they are uh, trying to go full remote for now uh, in the future, even uh, post COVID. But you always have the money invested on the offices and stuff like that. So you have to have a way. That's why you, you are hearing a lot of uh, hybrid uh, 
remote working, so you have a few days on the office and the rest at home because they have to have used to, to the office. Uh, I, I can tell uh, where I'm working, uh, the office are, are from them, so they will not put down the office. So it's normally uh, an option. They, they queried uh, uh, people working there. And um, the answer was most of people uh, like to work remotely. So uh, we have now a solution on hybrid. Uh, and if you want to work remote, you can do also. So the, it's, it's changing, obviously. And here is a key point that uh, could be a problem for some companies, for us not so much, but um, companies uh, that start to work remotely uh, figure out that there's not so much problem on getting people to work there. We know that some some companies uh, created office on zones or in cities to get, uh, get more uh, people uh, to work because they didn't have CVs enough for the, the amount of work that they had. Um, so the lack of IT people uh, was a real problem. Now, uh, we have people, uh, companies competing through all the, the, the market, which is good for us in the future, let's hope. <laughs> but the companies uh, will uh, we'll, um, see that as an uh, opportunity. At least it, it's my point of view. Thank you for your uh, replies. Let's move on. We still have 12 minutes or so. Rafalda? Uh, <laughs> how do you think companies can help communities to grow uh, besides financial support? While our guests think about this, I just want to, to say that after eight, the team said it is possible to keep the, the Proficonf online and anyone that is watching can jump in and talk with each other, right? Mm -hmm. Have a little bit of a meet and greet if you want. And now, please, uh, your answers. I can start on this. Um, well, uh, if it's not finance, could be with manpower and time for them. Um, so let's say uh, if I had uh, my Friday afternoon to work on my community or help the community, that will be nice. If it's not financial, uh, it, it, it should be some way of the, people that work on the community to do that. We have some open source approaches where companies have um, engineers there that uh, sponsor uh, open source uh, projects and help them and th their work it's for that. So why not for th the communities? Yeah, I think there's also there's also another resource that companies can can provide uh, to, to, to go along with what Ricardo was saying. Other than human resources, companies can also provide software. Um, if we're talking about a tech community or any community that needs uh, basic uh, software, uh, you can make a partnership with that with a company that does that software, give you that software for free. Uh, not to mention that there are already a lot of companies that have their uh, version of the software stack for non-profits if your community is a non-profit so you can you can take advantage of that uh, you can also partner with companies to give you data if you're trying to build uh, uh, some type of data product or project so uh, yeah I think you you there's there's a lot of other things you can you can kind of take from companies, but you always have to make sure that you create win-win situations where you also give them back. You don't want to be, uh, uh, th this is very important. You don't want to be, uh, um, how, how do you say, a hostage of a company where you feel that you're kind of, you're always owing them something. That's not something that you that you want if you're trying to be as, uh, uh, let's say, as unbiased as possible. 
agree with that. And I think that's also a really great idea from, from Ricardo. I would, and, and maybe just a little bit upon what Miguel is saying, is that this is something that we always try to do with the companies. It's We never try to see them as, uh, as our piggy bank or whatever, um, but we really try to think about, okay, yes, um, so we need the money to do what we want to do and we cannot do it without it, but then what value can we bring also to our sponsors or to our donor, donors or whatever besides the feeling of gratitude? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that's a really important approach. Um, but then besides those things, I think there's many other things. So for, for instance, um, even if you find that the community is interesting, then perhaps one, one interesting thing you could do is already start promoting it amongst your employees, for example, that, hey, this is, there's going to be an interesting event on topic X. No, if you want, you can join. Obviously, don't make it obligatory. That sounds like it's obligatory, but uh, you could at least promote it because there might be some people who are already interested. Um, I also know for a fact that there are some companies that actually take uh, field trips or whatever you want to call it to some, for example, data towns or whatever where they, they go and participate there. So that's also something interesting if there's a community that's organizing something like that. Um, one other thing that, that could be also interesting is content. Um, and beware when I talk about content because what one thing that communities really hate is that if you go on stage and start just selling yourself, but I'm talking about truly content that's useful for the community. So if we're talking about, oh yeah, since this is a, this is a DSP meetup, if we're talking about data science, um, don't go talking about, for example, recruitment, but rather talk about uh, the interesting technique that you do that does whatever, because I think then if it's something really interesting, then yeah, you, the recruitment will come in the follow-up networking events. Um, yeah, I think those are the things that come on top of my head besides what already Ricardo and Miguel said. Thank you. Next Please. question. Let's move on to what we said that is the last question. Uh, and after that, we'll open, uh, we'll stop the stream in YouTube. So don't worry about that. The stream to YouTube will be stopped. Um, and our team will let us, everyone that wants to enter in ProfiConf to, to enter and talk with, with our guests. So Mafalda, please. Uh, okay, next question. Uh, how did uh, this DSPT started and why? How did you came came up with the idea? What about the DSCG? Once you start. Think by the order of the questions first, Ricardo. I, I think we should call Rui to, to address this one. I think it's that, right? Maybe he can talk about it. Wait, do you want to jump on stage? We will have five minutes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, so no, I, I no, think we no discussed we discuss, uh, a little bit about this in the beginning, or uh, at least on, on some topics. Um, the SPT started um, as, um, as uh, an idea to uh, create a community where we should, could share um, the knowledge. Uh, so, um, it started uh, in um, um, in a year that uh, a lot of people were discussing about it, but um, no one was uh, actually, um, let's say, joining together to discuss and share their knowledge about that. So uh, the SPT started that way, so we could all uh, together um, as a community uh, help each other in uh, topics that uh, were uh, normally um, solved by one man team. Now, we obviously we're seeing that's different uh, nowadays, but most of the time companies even uh, didn't know how to handle this part. They knew that it existed and uh, they had one man show sometimes and uh, people didn't have uh, no one to discuss with it. So um, Rui Mendes, it's it's the the main key here uh, to create the SPT. It's it's her his vision uh, on this uh, part, and the idea was 
actually uh, move away from the companies' meetups that were happening. So was a non-profit uh, organization uh, with no company attached and try to bring um, to the community um, knowledge uh, with uh, a lot of speakers that uh, we define as um, persons of interest to share to the community their their work and their problems, how they solved it. And that's the way we think that it's uh, a good option to, to share their knowledge. So we, we decided that um, there's no hiring, uh, just share knowledge in our meetups. And this is was the way um, and vision, mostly the vision of uh, Remiens. Uh, clap for him is responsible for the SPT. He's hearing me out. We will have a beer and we will uh, joke about what I said today, probably. But um, uh, yeah, uh, that's the, the key point uh, to uh, create the SPT. Um, that's all. About the SCCG, you want to talk, Miguel? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so the SSG, um, so I've, I first started having this idea of, uh, of doing data science project with data science projects with volunteers uh, in in Portugal, like around the beginning of 2018, uh, very much inspired by also what the SPT was doing in the data science field, because they were, the SPT was really the main, uh, the, the first organization to truly get the community rolling and talking about it. And, you know, it really kickstarted the, the data science movement in Portugal. So for me, it also got me thinking about this idea of like, okay, how how do we, what if we get all these data scientists working on everything that they already do during the day, but kind of for the bad side, you know, like for the, for the, the dark side, the commercial uh, purpose. And can, can we make that work for a nonprofit? Um, and can we improve the data literacy in, in Portugal? Can, can we, can we explain you know, a, a simple nonprofit in a, in a in a small village in the south of Portugal. You know, uh, that data is important for them. So, yeah, I was very much inspired by the SPT. Then, in the end uh, of of 2018, I met uh, a few other people from from Lisbon. So, I was based in Porto, in the north of Portugal. Back then, I met uh, three other people from Lisbon that had connections to to uh, a university in Lisbon that had a connection with a DSSG movement in the USA called uh, DSSG Chicago. Um, and uh, so I, I never heard of anyone moving strings in Portugal other, that, uh, other than that fellowship, but that fellowship only occurred during the summer. And I wanted something that, that occurred during the whole year and that it was a, a true movement. So I mean, it's 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 what you do in these situations. Uh, you 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 couple with people that are already doing what you also want to do. Like Ricardo was saying, don't don't try to reinvent the wheel. If you see that there's something already brewing, why not join forces and do it together? So we we joined forces. Uh, we started as uh, four co-founders, and then we kind of took the the back then the, their idea was a bit different than mine. They were just thinking about a few, uh, you know events to raise awareness maybe some conferences and meetups about data science for social good but i was much more focused on the projects doing social good projects using data uh, so we took that idea we tried with a with a kind of a um uh, a dry run with with a simple beneficiary and then it, the spark continued more people wanted to join in and it made sense to to create the organization Thank you. <laughs> you want to finish, Mario? I, I just want to ask Leone, do you want to add anything? <laughs> it's your last time to disagree with each other. No? I cannot disagree. Yeah. Okay, we tried. <laughs> so I want to think everyone. the guests that are here answering all your questions not all uh, we, we are sorry for
to talk with them. We also want to thank our sponsors. for our uh, remote meetups. We are hoping to make more on, on this kind of events. It's especially important this, that you give months to come, and it's quite hard to Again, motivate the community. We'll stop the stream, and anyone is uh, welcome to join within our. I... You can say bye. Bye. Okay, thank you. <laughs>